Hello mates, so today isn't a character analysis video, but the first video targeting animation and design in Transformers Prime. Any avid watcher of the show notices at some time with certain characters that there is a huge difference in size when they transform. Our top complaints are aimed at Predaking and RC, and it is so blatant that you can find mention of their apparent mass changes in the wiki. But to some extent, you see some strange things happening to all the characters between their transformations. Of course, it is never as terribly bad as G1 was, and then IDW embraced mass change. So, what is going on in Transformers Prime? I'm happy to say that for this video, I have the written proof to give you an answer. It won't be so much speculation this time, because we have this wonderful book, The Art of Prime. In the style of Emperor Kumquat, I will do more than answer the question, but puke up all the information I know about the subject and whack you with examples. Well, I hope you're here for the facts, and a peek into the book I paid like, 55 Canadian dollars for. Is mass change a problem in Transformers Prime? The answer is yes, but no. Yes, because there are design flaws that are known by the designers, admitted even in this book. No, because Transformers Prime does not allow mass change scientifically. It does not confirm it in its universe, and the designers try hard to create step-by-step -step transformation sequences, keep character weight consistent, and they allow for metal to stretch a bit, calling it living metal. They want us to believe that Predaking really can become so compact and break out into this massive beast so that we have this large dragon instead of a little wimpy one. I will point out all the key information on this topic that I can't find in this book, and I will target the characters with the largest problems. Let's dive in. <sighs> Hold on. Wait a minute. So this book is full of so many juicy facts that I think I'll have to create a later video just on this book. Some real good trivia here. Alright, so how does transformation work in Transformers Prime? Transformation is explained in its own way in the various Transformers continuities. While others have used Transformium, giving Cybertronians an ability to change their elements and shift into anything, Transformers Prime does not adapt this. The show tells us about the limits, that a grounder cannot simply scan an aerial vehicle and gain flight. To have such a body change requires advanced surgery, which the Decepticons are capable of, this is why the Autobots lament the air superiority of the Decepticons, and Starscream bothers Knockout for continuing to stay wheeled. I must in turn ask why successful termination of Starscream has not been achieved. Air superiority continues to provide the cons with the upper hand. A pity you are incapable of flight. Yeah, like I'm gonna let that stop me. Never understood why any self-respecting Decepticon would choose automobile as his vehicle mode when he could have flight. Megatron was once flightless and had been modified at some point in the past. The books even describe each bot as having a most natural vehicular form. So there is a limit to how their bodies can change. A TCOG can only instruct their body to rearrange so much. This is what differentiates them from the Muticons a race of Transformer far away in the universe that really is able to transform into anything. They can meld together even into functioning spaceships, but because of their unlimited transformation power, they struggle with having an identity. This is also why not everyone can scan each other to take on their appearances. Shapeshifters, such as Nexus Prime and Makeshift, are very rare, not changing their masses, but stretching, compacting, detaching, rearranging, and changing their colors with better control. Well, these are the rules the aligned continuity sets up, but sometimes sloppy writing or just things I don't understand come along. First off, Cybertronians have vehicular, natural forms on their own planet, so why couldn't Skyquake fly until he scans something? How do Cybertronians get things like seats, seatbelts, and wheels? How would they create those non-metallic new parts if they do not have Transformium, let alone control it like Knockout can? Also, we know that they are not built inside like vehicles, they have Cybertronian organs. Knockout mentions transmission fluid, which may not be the same as ours, but something his body produces to be able to drive. Alright, fine, we can brush that one away. Gasoline is a confirmed no, which I'm glad to hear. At least you don't have to buy gasoline. A TCOG isn't technology, it is biology. Which means it will reject any power source other than Energon. So then, if they do not grow car engines and parts when they scan vehicles, 
keeping their own organs, then how is it that they have wheels, sticks, and pedals that can control them? Where did Nako get a radio? Gah. The one answer we do have is that Cybertronians have things like cockpits, because there was an era where the Quintessons enslaved them. The cockpits had been installed so that Cybertronians could carry them around. Afterward, I assume the Cybertronians just liked having storage areas for themselves. These are the only issues in Transformers Prime that I cannot find any wild explanation for. I can only hope that they chose to put seats and such into themselves to appear more real, and that some parts the TCOG copied, but ignored other parts, like actual car engines. So why did Transformers Prime limit itself anyway? Well, that is not explained explicitly, but I would assume that things would get out of control budget-wise and plot-wise if anybody could become anything. What would stop any of the characters from hiding as anything, transforming into each other and becoming spies, or the Autobots from becoming jets? Their metal is not just metal. Living metal, not the first time it has been thought up, but Transformers Prime embraced it because of their budget. Firstly, they tried very hard to make realistic transformations. They wanted to have the step-by-steps, the parts moving and locking into place, a wow factor, a 3D animation. The interview included inside this book of David Hartman mentions this. Hartman was the supervising director slash art director. And he explained that they had not wanted to go for that cartoon, squash, and stretch. Truly, that is easier, and you can make characters become anything. And because of that cartoon style, you can accept the lack of realism and don't worry about the mass changing. Transformers Prime tried to present itself as more realistic, putting so much time into quality, which is why we can judge it. And you know what, it did a great job. The show's robots are quite complicated, especially if you look at Predaking. Pardon me, uh, Jose Lopez, art director, characters and props, claims that when it was decided that it would be CG, he said, let's make it crazy. Let's make it as intricate as it possibly can be compared to animated and other incarnations of Transformers. And hey, the art did end up being good enough for its own book, didn't it? Yeah. I bought it at Chapters Indigo, please don't ask me down in the comments again. Hartman explains that they could not have the same amount of parts like the Bay movies. The biggest question for them was how could they move the robots' faces to create expressions if they could not have all those little parts? How could they open their mouths without a puppet-looking robot hinge mouth? They decided they wanted these malleable, flexible faces made of alien metal. I could not tell you what their eyebrows are attached to, but I can tell you that this is why their eyebrows can wiggle into funky shapes. This is how they shape their mouths and close their eyes. This flexible metal also seems to be used on Starscream's wrists. Back to my own speculations, it does not seem that all their metal is flexible all the time. Their arms metals aren't going to wrinkle up like shirt fabric, but they remain hard and fixed until transformation. If all of their body is living metal, metal with unique DNA called CNA, that is warm and extra delicious to scraplets, then everything is likely malleable when commanded to be by the TCOG. This stretchiness of the metal would allow our bots to become either larger or smaller in transformation. For Bulkhead, RC, Bumblebee, and Smokescreen, their pieces might compress to make themselves tighter. For the Predacons, their metal stretches out to increase their size. But what this could mean is interesting. Predaking is said to be stronger in beast mode, which can be understood by his addition of claws, teeth, fire, and wings, size that gets in your way, and he has more range of motion. He has the same body strength in all forms to carry himself and objects. He is compact and probably feels limited in his bot body. We know as viewers that Predaking is supposed to be the same weight from the sound effects used. They are the same in his beast form, but also quite different from the footsteps of other characters. Predaking is so heavy in this form that Skylinks cannot carry him while Ultramagnus is a breeze. But for all Cybertronians, 
The mode where you are stretched out has one weakness. Your metal is thinner and easier to break through. Cutting into RC in bot form or predicating in beast form would actually cause more damage to them than their compact forms. Flexible metal also allows Starscream to flatten himself and smooth out to become aerodynamic and for metal to attach to itself like Darksteel's neck and shoulders in transformation. But knowing this does not eliminate all the scaling problems. It does fortunately help us feel better about Predaking growing so large and RC becoming small enough for it to ride on. But the designers knew they were cheating a little, simply because they had certain desires in mind. Let's see what was said. The interview question. Can you ever get away with cheating on the character's relative sizes, or is that very much locked in? Lopez's response. That's locked in. I think we've done a few cheats here and there, especially in relationship to the humans. But in CG, once you lock it in, the size of the character is pretty much set. You can, but it's really difficult to go back and change it. If you want to, you have to go into post-production and manipulate shots and stuff. But to actually change the models, it's very difficult. So people, we may have the world's largest motorcycle, but at least she is always the same scale. Lopez later says this. Some of the stuff we would keep an eye on, like the size of the vehicle compared to the robot, because we do want to manipulate the robot to be a lot bigger in relation to the humans than the vehicle. With the vehicles, you have to keep it sort of normal. So now we are seeing that this desire to make these Cybertronians titans compared to the humans has caused the issue. Remember how they advertised Predaking to be this massive, powerful creature with a wingspan of two football fields? I think they're just a bit too focused on creating big and posing bots. If you want to reimagine the show as more realistic, especially if you want to draw it, then you're going to have to shrink the size of the bots a bit. My largest issue is actually, one, Skylinks' wings, which stretch out so much but seem to be too small to carry his weight, and two, the tires of the characters. Breakdown is a military vehicle, so he might be excused, and Optimus as a truck as well. But if you ever want to get riled up, compare the tires to humans. Bulkhead is the worst offender, who has like monster truck tires in bot form compared to Miko. Then much thinner and smaller tires in bot form. We discussed the stretching of metal, but these tires should not be changing sizes, so the problem smacks us in the face. Look at Knockout or the Viacons, who are just regular sized cars. Wheels in real life are smaller than teenagers and children, so how is it that theirs are the size of a whole adult? And Smokescreen and Bumblebee's car doors are larger than these humans as well. So again, probably best to draw these parts smaller on your bots, and the bots smaller in general as well. At least Megatron can get away with his massive self with his purely Cybertronian alternate form. Lopez adds, We'll go in and cheat some stuff. RC is the most obvious one. RC, when we first designed her, because we knew she was going to change so much in size, I tried to hide the vehicular parts as much as possible. I tried to keep the wheels hidden, and that was one of the conversations we had early on, where they would say we're not showing enough vehicle parts on her, and I said, I'm trying to hide them because the wheel goes from here to here, and it's going to be really obvious. I think RC has been nailed down. What's next? He says, one of the issues, because of the limited asset count that we have on the show, is a lot of the time they'll come in and you'll see the robot before they can scan the vehicle. So they're not Cybertronian. Aha, so Skyquake of course had a Cybertronian seeker mode, and that was sloppy writing. <laughs> Sorry, I have so many emotions about that episode. Continue, Lopez. The argument is that they should be Cybertronian. They'd be completely different, and then once they scan it, completely change and become something else. We would have loved to do a Cybertronian version, and then do a version once he scanned the vehicle. So there we go. Budget problems limited them, so let's use our imagination to fix the errors. Let's just extend it to all the other errors and make ourselves feel better, yeah? Vehicons and Insecticons. Sure, more enemies at a cheaper cost. It's fine. Copy and paste zombie bodies, we understand. Just imagine that they all look different. When was design ever standard in the line continuity? Robots in the Skies says this is how Bumblebee looked in the time of Transformers Prime. Well, the old games gave everyone noses. Is this how Starscream looked in the past, or was it this? Or are both not to be taken as exact? Does he have jagged Predaking teeth or not? The answer, 
Take nothing as exact. In times of scaling issues and budgets and the chaos of the continuity that was supposed to be united, choose what you like best and try to logic out how they might have looked. Starscream gets mistaken as Silver Bolt in the second book? Probably Silver at that point. Starscream, probably smooth teeth because he's not supposed to look like a bad guy, he's supposed to be the cunning one, the charming one that you underestimate and get hurt by, not the one that frightens you by appearance. That's Megatron's job. Noses, mm <laughs> So I had a lot of fun doing the research for this question and sharing some information in the book with those who do not have it. I, I don't think it's legal for me to show too much visually, but I will come back to this particular book someday and share the hilarious, interesting words inside. The next book study will take me a long time to prepare, a summary and review of Transformers Exodus, the first novel connecting to Transformers Prime. As well as our usual character analysis videos, I'm planning to throw in shorter information bits themed by topic from the Covenant of Primus. Not everyone knows the lore beyond Transformers Prime and that there are answers to some of your questions. Do you know why there are Cybertronians with animalistic bodies? What was the Apex armor created for? Thanks for watching, mates, and subscribe if you want more. This is motivating me, I promise. And don't be surprised by the random mean nonsense I throw in. I generally toss in something silly before I post another large video. If you want regular, random facts and nonsense on a regular basis, find me on Tumblr. Also, I'm going to apologize for my voice giving out and um, just generally sounding weird. You might notice over time that my voice is changing throughout the videos. So I apologize if it bothers you, but I hope that the content and the words will be good enough for you to continue. Oh, will my torment never end?